Ja, meine Damen und Herren, ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich zu unserer äh, zweiten Veranstaltung im Rahmen der Vorlesungsvortragsreihe ähm, Europa nach dem ähm, Angriff Putins auf die Ukraine. Uh, and, and given the fact that we have a guest today from, from Italy who is speaking English, uh, I will switch right away uh, to the English language. We're very pleased uh, that you can welcome tonight uh, Professor Natalie Tocci. She is uh, the director of the Institute for International Affairs in Rome. Uh, she has been there uh, since 2017, but beyond that had very uh, significant um, Uh, appointments both in academia uh, as well as in policy. Uh, in the field of policy in particular, she has been um, a, uh, a special advisor to the high representative of the European Union for foreign and security policy uh, and the vice president of the European Commission, Federica Mogherini from 2015 to 2019, uh, but also uh, her successor, uh, Joseph Borrell, Uh, from 2020 until more, more, most recently, until February 2022. Uh, Dr. Tocci has been educated uh, in Oxford University, at Oxford University uh, and has since had diverse uh, um, appointments uh, in uh, academia as well, most recently as the Pierre Keller Visiting Professor at Harvard University and uh, for uh, some time now, I think, at the University of Tübingen, which we envy uh, uh, for having succeeded in securing you uh, as an assistant professor there. Uh, in her uh, academic career before, she had been a, a research fellow at different institutions in Brussels, uh, but also a Jean Monnet fellow and Marie Curie fellow at the European University Institute, the key uh, academic institution. Uh, of European affairs. Since then, um, <clears throat> she has been uh, a member of uh, different boards, both in the policy field, but also uh, uh, in the field that is closer to uh, private economy. Uh, the European Center, Policy Center in Brussels, uh, the Jacques Delors Centre, uh, the European Leadership Network, uh, the European Council of Foreign Relations, just to mention a few. Uh, being an academic, uh, Dr. Tocci has been also a uh, very prolific a writer. Uh, she has published mostly on uh, issues that are related in one or another way to European affairs, uh, and she is probably rightly known uh, mostly for having been the key writer uh, in uh, Mogherini's staff in Brussels of the European Global Strategy, a key document uh, of the European Union as far as positioning itself uh, in international affairs is concerned. We are very glad, Natalie, that you were willing uh, to join us uh, today. Uh, a, a short trip because uh, Dr. Tocci arrived in the afternoon and she will have to return right after the talk uh, tonight to Rome. Uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Uh, the title is Europe, Age of Idealism to an Age of War. After the talk, we'll have time for discussion. Thank you very much again. and. Well, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Indeed, it's going to be quite short, but I'm sure it's going to be delightful. Um, so, um, indeed, what I wanted to, to talk to you about um, is, is really the way in which the war in Ukraine has propelled, I think, our continent and, and arguably beyond that as well, uh, really across, if you like, different faces, huh? which uh, I think now in retrospect, we can see more clearly where we were coming from, what we have gone through, where we're at, perhaps we can't see as clearly <laughs> where we will go to uh, next, but perhaps let me just uh, take these first minutes, um, because I think it's important to sort of really trace the journey, which is a journey which obviously has to do with the Europe-Russia relationship, as well as obviously Ukraine, but I think also speaks more broadly about the way in which uh, Europe and the European Union um, have really located themselves within the broader international system. So we started off, and as indeed the talk 
uh, the title of the talk suggests, uh, we used to live in a world uh, of idealism. Mm -hmm. uh, it was essentially what in shorthand is often referred to as the liberal international order. Uh, it was basically the period that went from the end of the Cold War up until my personal cutoff date uh, is actually 2008, I will say in a minute why, uh, 2008. Uh, but essentially, this was an age in which um, there was presumably only one destination of history. It was the end of history. Uh, sooner or later, all countries would have got to the Holy Land. Huh? And essentially, the, our job uh, would have been that of accelerating those journeys. And whether that acceleration took place through policies of enlargement, through neighborhood policies, through regional cooperation policies, uh, through looser forms of association, or if you were not in Europe, but you sat in Washington, D.C., uh, that acceleration even took very extreme forms. Huh? I mean, just think back at the war in Iraq, you know, bombing countries into democracies. I mean, at least so the narrative went, right? Uh, and so it was really an age in which, even with all of its successes, was really imbued with the sense of, as I said, there is one destination uh, uh, to history. And if you look at it through the prism of the Europe-Russia relationship, well, obviously, Russia was a country that was never meant to be integrated in the European Union. And yet there was this sense of idealism that there would have been a free and open and cooperative and to an extent also integrated space between Lisbon and Vladivostok. And this was really the, uh, in a sense, the age that we lived in. Now, why do I put my cutoff point around 2008? Well, basically, because of reasons that obviously have both to do with Europe, but they also have to do with the broader international system. And what's interesting about 2008, the two key things happen in 2008, which are apparently unrelated to one another. The first is the global financial crisis, 2008, 2009. And what does the global financial crisis tell us? Well, it's the beginning of what becomes known as no longer the unipolar era, uh, essentially marked by US hegemony, but the beginning of a multipolar era. And in that multipolar era, where obviously there was still the United States, there was Europe, but there was the idea of um, sort of emerging or re-emerging powers like China or like uh, Russia. I mean, these was, this was also the time of the BRICS debate, ah, the Brazils, the South Africans. And what was behind this notion was that indeed the West and therefore the United States and Europe would remain important players. But the global financial crisis signaled a relative decline of the West and a relative <coughs> increase in the power of non-Western powers. And it was not just power uh, that was being redistributed in the international system, but the idea that there was also greater normative contestation within the international system. This was no longer the end of history. There was no longer a single destination uh, to history. It was, no, it was the beginning of the cracks in the so-called liberal international order. Now, what is also interesting, of course, about 2008 is that something else happened that was far more directly related to Russia, and that's obviously the war in Georgia. Now, in many respects, again, you know, this is a debate that uh, is very prominent at the moment. When is it that we as Europeans should have started waking up to the fact that we were looking at and facing a very different type of Russia? Was it the 2007 Munich security speech by Putin? Was it 2008 huh? and, uh, and the invasion of, of Georgia? And I remember sort of, you know, prior to the invasion of Ukraine, when there was, you know, when things, obviously there was military buildup uh, in, uh, you know, along, uh, along the borders of Ukraine. Uh, and of course, no one, quite expected uh, the large scale invasion uh, that we saw, but many increasingly expected to see a Georgia on steroids. So again, you know, give, this gives a sense that in many respects, we knew back uh, in 2007, or at the very least in 2008, when it happened, uh, that this was just the beginning of an ongoing uh, show. Now, 
if that age of idealism ends uh, in around 2008, what age do we enter uh, after that year? And I would say that beginning in around 2008, up until the 24th of February of this year, we enter an age that I would define as an age of pragmatism. Why an age of pragmatism? Well, uh, it was an age in which indeed we no longer had the illusion uh, of this liberal international order that would spread uh, effort effortlessly uh, uh, across the, the globe, that there were different norms and values that were uh, competing, uh, and that, you know, I mean, we were no longer as starry-eyed uh, about the future. We also, and this was especially a consequence of uh, the rude wake-up after the disaster of the war in Iraq, also started seeing that that age of idealism, and this is why I cite Iraq, came with a very heavy, including normative baggage, uh, given the catastrophe that it led to uh, across the Middle East. So maybe this age of idealism wasn't all that great altogether. And the pendulum had to swing back to an extent, to a degree of pragmatism. And, and, and that pragmatism also had to do with the recognition that indeed there were other powers emerging or re-emerging on the scenes that did not quite uh, and would not quite uh, agree uh, with us, but we had to learn to live with them in different uh, shapes uh, and forms. But pragmatism, and this is, I think, specific as far as Russia is concerned, cut actually both ways. So on the one hand, there was indeed this recognition that indeed, you know, we didn't quite like the way in which Russia was uh, developing, um, but we had to learn to live with it, uh, and therefore we had to decide, uh, in a sense, uh, something that in the document that, that indeed I, I drafted, the EU Global Strategy, was said, you know, we had to selectively engage with Russia. Didn't quite like, as I said, how Russia was, uh, was evolving, but we would still need to find ways and means of reaching out with Russia, maybe on more narrow, uh, on a more narrow set of questions, because at the end of the day, Russia is there, it's always going to be there, and we simply have to learn uh, to live with it. So pragmatism cut one way, and then of course it cut the other way, i.e. the recognition that this is, and of course this recognition uh, peaked after 2014, um, this, is, this is a revisionist power, uh, it's an increasingly assertive and increasingly aggressive power, uh, and therefore pragmatism also came with the flip side of the coin, which of course a policy of, uh, of sanctions. So there was pragmatism, as I said, that kind of cut, uh, cut up both, uh, both sides. Um, now, I think that age of pragmatism, as I said, kind of essentially brings us up to the 24th of February. Up until then, even though if one actually looks at it, after 2014, progressively so, um, the pragmatism that was pushing towards sanctions had, you know, that, 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 that line, in a sense, strengthened over time as Russia's own behavior it, it became increasingly aggressive over time. And on the side of the selective engagement, the topics on which we could actually selectively engage on became narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. Uh, I remember sort of uh, up until the autumn of last year, when the EU delegation uh, in Moscow had organized back in September, um, you know, obviously sort of trying to look for topics to actually engage uh, uh, Moscow on. And literally the only agenda item left was climate. And interestingly, actually climate, I'll come back like, perhaps to energy and climate uh, later, uh, but interestingly, it was the only topic on which uh, the Kremlin still had an interest in the EU, uh, because whereas the Kremlin, of course, does not consider us to be a particularly credible actor uh, when it comes to issues like security and defense, it does look at us as being a credible actor uh, on other uh, areas, uh, including on energy and, and on climate. And of course, this was in the run up to, to Glasgow. It was also at the time, and increasingly so as the debate on the carbon border adjustment mechanism was bubbling away. And this was literally the only agenda item left on selective engagement. So you have uh, that, that age of pragmatism from 2008 to uh, 2022 
in which, whereas in that first phase, it was definitely the engagement that prevailed over the sanctions. Starting in 2014, it's increasingly the sanctions that prevail on selective engagement. So the balance, in a sense, changes over time. And then here we are, 24th of February, we obviously enter a different age. Now, what is this age? Well, kind of very uh, unimaginatively, it's an age of war. Now, what do I mean and what do I not mean by an age uh, of war? Um, and I think sort of what I would have, what, what, what I would say now is probably quite different from what I would have said uh, right uh, at the beginning of, of the war. So I think what we can say now uh, with some degree of confidence to the extent one can be confident about anything these days is that that age of war does not mean one of two uh, extremes. Uh, thankfully so, I think that age of war does not mean uh, that we're on the cusp of World War III. This was a fear that was very present, I think, at the beginning uh, of the war in Ukraine. I mean, the idea, especially given the, uh, I think, um, calculus, uh, also to an extent, the wrong calculus uh, that many Europeans, but also Americans made concerning Russia's military capability. Of course, we know what its nuclear <coughs> capabilities are, but in that uh, fear of World War III uh, narrative, right at the beginning of the war, there was very much the sense of um, after Ukraine, what comes next? Is it going to be a spiller over the war in, in Poland? Is it going to be the Baltics? Or is it going to be something more, quote unquote, modest uh, like Moldova? But there was the sense of there is a real possibility that the war will go beyond uh, Ukraine and particularly, and to the extent that this spills into NATO territory, it could trigger World War III. Um, now, I don't mean to say that that possibility is excluded. Well, of course, one cannot exclude it uh, altogether. But I think that, you know, uh, four months on to this war, thankfully, it's, uh, it looks like it is less of a possibility than what it looked like on the 24th or 25th of, uh, of February. And that's the good news. Then the bad news. There's also, I think, um, uh, what an age of war does not mean is that somehow, and maybe this is a slightly more controversial statement, that somehow this war is going to settle into a new Cold War. I think that is widely optimistic. And I think it's widely optimistic because the Cold War um, was uh, fought between two adversaries, meaning the United States and the Soviet Union, that had fought on the same side of the hot war. And the hot war was, of course, the Second World War. Now, there is a hot war that is going on, and that is the war in Ukraine. And the global superpowers, uh, so to speak, are either directly fighting, as in the case of Russia, or indirectly supporting, as in the case of the US, Europe, but also China, on the other side, opposing sides of that hot war. So I somehow can't quite picture the dynamics that will lead the current war in Ukraine to settle into a steady state that is going to be Cold War-like, uh, that was, you know, bad in many ways, but it also had a degree of predictability that I just cannot see this current war uh, settling into. So to me, an age of war does not mean either of those two extremes. Neither does it mean the very bad extreme of the Third World War, uh, nor does it mean the not exactly good, but not catastrophic uh, scenario of a new uh, Cold War? Uh, and that second ruling out is perhaps more pessimistic than one what many often, often debate. So I think this age of war is something in between these, uh, these two extremes. And, and what could this uh, sort of uh, in between uh, actually mean? Um, well, I think to answer that question, it will depend to a very uh, sort of large extent on how long is this war going to last. Uh, and I can't, um, I, I could imagine a scenario whereby it could last for a very long time, not at the current level of intensity that I don't see, 
But I see a scenario which is in many ways a very troubling scenario in which this war could devolve in a very uh, irregular, unlinear way. So let us imagine, for, for both military, but also for political reasons. So I could well imagine a situation whereby um, one gets to, for instance, the autumn, uh, the winter, in which Russian military capabilities will reduce. Uh, some figures, I don't know how, um, how uh, accurate they are, but you know, two or three weeks ago, I heard one figure that really stuck in my mind uh, because I think it, to the extent that it's at least close to the truth, it, it gives us a picture. Uh, I was told that um, you know, Russia so far has fired around 1,600 missiles and that it has between 500 and 600 left and that it takes um, one year to produce 200. Now, only that, I mean, of course, there are many military capabilities, but just this gives us a sense that it's very difficult to imagine a situation whereby Russia can sustain this level of, uh, of military activity for years and years. Now, this obviously could sound like good news, huh? and of course it is huh, to an extent, but why do I think that it could lead to a war which is very unlinear and therefore could be very protracted? Because let us imagine a scenario in which indeed by the time we get to the autumn, the winter, the level of violence reduces. War doesn't stop. Huh? I mean, there isn't a peace agreement, huh? but the level of violence reduces. We will be, and by we, I mean, especially we Europeans uh, will be, you know, we Germans, we Italians, in the midst of a very, very cold and very expensive winter. And that is, I think, a fact uh, by now. At that point, given that that level of violence will have reduced, I think politically, not so much militarily on the side of the West, but politically, there will be a very strong push for, let's call it a day, not a peace agreement. I'm not talking about a peace agreement. Frankly speaking, I cannot imagine a peace agreement being signed so long as Vladimir Putin remains president of Russia. I just can't see it. But you could imagine that there could be something truce-like uh, uh, in, you know, as I said, whether it's in five, six, seven months' time, I don't know. But would that mean the end of the war? I don't think it would. I think basically it would just mean a period in which Russia regains a level of capability to start Mark II uh, of this war. And you could imagine this going in, uh, in cycles for a very, very long time. Now, what, so what, what are the implications uh, of something like this? What are the implications for Ukraine, for Russia, and, and, and for Europe? Well, I think for Ukraine, they, and obviously these three things are connected uh, to, to one another. I think for Ukraine, the real risk is that of a state, which is a very big state, of course, it's a big country, which becomes a hyper-militarized uh, country, because inevitably, if you're in the state of a protracted war, you don't have a choice. Uh, you have to be a hyper-militarized uh, country. Now, that's not great news for democracy, frankly speaking. So in a country which obviously does want to move forward in terms of consolidating its democracy, being in a permanent, literally in a permanent state of war does not bode well. Neither do I see um, the trillion uh, of euros of reconstruction money that will flood Ukraine if Ukraine remains in a state of war may not be, as I said, at the level that we're seeing today, but it will be in a fundamentally uh, sort of insecure state. Who is going to put all those billions, you know, hundreds of billions of euros in? So this, I think, creates a massive problem for Ukraine to begin with, but also for us as, uh, as Europeans. Russia, of course, is uh, to an extent an even bigger problem because to the extent that this uh, state of war is going to be protracted, we're going to be uh, in a situation in which uh, obviously there will not be uh, a relationship with Russia. Uh, I am amongst those that uh, do not think that there is a shining future for Russia uh, that ends up being a satellite of China or a massive North Korea. Uh, I don't think that that is 
fundamentally something that again is really sustainable in the long term and so the even bigger risk that i see for russia is of a state that perhaps not from one day to the next but gradually corrodes and perhaps even at some point even implodes creating a problem which ultimately is going to fall also uh, onto us as as europeans now i say all this because um you know, I, I think that the that paradoxically, perhaps, the temptation that we will have in maybe only a few months' time to uh, politically ride on a, a reduced level of violence to, to, to not to call it a day, but to kind of you know take one one step back, could actually put us in a situation. Where, where, whereby we would be uh, complicit in a war that protracts with consequences, both for Ukraine, for Russia, and consequently for us as Europeans, that would be even greater um, than if at the moment in which the level of violence reduces, actually that being the moment to double down militarily in order to finish the war. But I think that politically, it will be extremely difficult uh, for us uh, as Europeans to uh, sort of to follow, especially given the situation that we're going to be economically uh, at that point in time. Now, it could be that ultimately this is not our call to make. It could be that ultimately it's the US that will make this call, given that it's the US primarily uh, that is providing weapons to Ukraine, and exactly how the calculus in the United States will be in six months' time. I don't know, uh, but, but I, I, I simply wanted to sort of share this thought with you because I think it raises the possibility and the, the, the potential paradox that we will fall into a temptation to end something sooner. And by doing it, we, are, we risk protracting it uh, even, uh, even further. Now, very final uh, set of thoughts that I wanted to share, perhaps related, but, but also not related is where does all of this leave Europe, the European uh, project? Now, on this, uh, I think it's useful to sort of break it down in different policy areas, because I think one can tell um, very different stories depending on which policy angle we're looking at it uh, from. So um, beginning with, um, I guess, beginning with uh, the, 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 the first political point. Huh? Um, I think the war, uh, and, and therefore actually with one of the main good stories right, that has emerged from this war, I think that this war, and actually if you think of it, uh, also the pandemic, enabled the European Union to rediscover a magic little word that is at the heart of the European project, and that's solidarity. It's a word that we have forgotten about. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the Eurozone crisis, with the migration crisis, uh, we had forgotten that this is basically what, you know, this is the word that is at the heart of the European project. We rediscovered it with the pandemic, and I think we've consolidated that rediscovery uh, with, with the war. Now, the question is, how long is this going to last? How long is it going to last amongst ourselves? Uh, and to an extent, you see the way, for instance, in which whatever, you know, Germany and Italy are competing over gas contracts, huh? um, not exactly a kind of great showing of solidarity. Um, so to what extent are we going to realize that much like in the case of vaccines, um, it would strengthen us all if this is simply bumped up uh, to the European level, because of course the bargaining power at EU level uh, is much higher hmm, than if, individual countries, including big countries, uh, try and uh, go gas hunting on, uh, on their own. So I think there's a question of kind of solidarity, so far good, uh, but to what extent is it going to be uh, sustained? And of course, this is exactly the fact that it will not be sustained for a long time is exactly what Putin is banking on. I mean, there is a fundamental belief, I think, in the Kremlin, uh, and this is a belief that, you know, if, I don't know how many of you will recall the interview that Putin gave to the Financial Times. I'm not mistaken, it was February 
2019, um, in which he basically kind of, you know, portrayed himself as the leader of the illiberal uh, world and really went to great lengths in explaining why it is that liberal democracies are fundamentally weak and fragile. Um, and I think the jury's out. Uh, I think what's interesting, another word that I'm very attached to uh, is resilience. And you see the way in which when you look at the resilience of liberal democracies, there are really two sides of this coin, and the question of which side is really going to prevail. Because there is one side of resilience as applied to liberal democracies that says, well, liberal democracies are fundamentally resilient because they have this ability to adapt and to change. Huh? Um, and yes, it could be very messy at times, huh? but this is essentially what the source of our resilience is all about. You have another uh, side uh, to resilience, which basically says that liberal democracies are not resilient because we have a very level, uh, low level of endurance to pain, mm? precisely because our voters vote uh, and, uh, and our, in our debates, people talk. Uh, the minute in which the pain starts being felt, you know, again, you know, this is why I refer to the risk of, of the autumn winter in the midst of a cold and expensive winter, that the bet that Putin is making is that that second uh, aspect of resilience is going to prevail, and therefore our lack of resilience is going to dominate uh, the show. And I think this is true internally within countries, as well as obviously between countries in the EU. So I think there's a, a political question which has to do with resilience and with solidarity, where so far, so good, but for how long, I think is, uh, is the open question. Then I think there's um, a, a, a sort of another big sort of piece of this puzzle, which has to do with enlargement. And I think, you know, enlargement is, um, is, a, is an interesting piece, I think, of the European story, uh, because if you look at moments and, you know, we could go back to the southern enlargement and northern enlargement, but let's just take, in a sense, from the eastern enlargement onwards, it is very clear how we went through three periods. Uh, again, you had a first period, end of the Cold War, the strategic imperative of reuniting Europe after the Cold War divide was so dominant that despite the trillion different problems uh, that existed, uh, economically, rule of law, I mean, all sorts of reasons, um, strategically, but ultimately that imperative was much more powerful and that prevailed. That world started fading away. And after we finish, and actually it's not a coincidence, I keep on coming back to the same dates, you know, after 2007, so after the completion of that Eastern enlargement with Romania and Bulgaria in 2007, of course, there was then Croatia in 2013, but just bracketing Croatia uh, out, um, basically we started losing the oomph uh, behind enlargement, because all of a sudden it was no longer that strategic imperative. Um, we had our internal problems to worry about. We had the Eurozone, we had migration, we had Brexit, I mean, then we had, of course, the pandemic. And, and somehow we thought that we could keep that kind of complicated world outside. And I mean, it was a great thought. Huh? I mean, of course, it would be great if somehow one could keep problems outside. Now, the war in Ukraine, I think, has um, sort of propelled us back into a world in which problems can't actually be kept outside. And so far, we have not developed uh, a particularly effective answer um, that is not enlargement related. I mean, this is essentially the truth. I'm not arguing here that there shouldn't be different answers other than enlargement. It would be great if we actually had a foreign policy. But given that the truth is that so far, the only way we have found to actually stabilize countries around them is by taking them in. This, by the way, is not just an EU question. I think it, I think the war in Ukraine also raises a NATO question. Again, I'm not making this argument um, to say that you know, NATO should have enlarged uh, to Ukraine. In fact, I've been someone who in the past was very skeptical about the idea of NATO's enlargement. Um, but I cannot be self-critical today and ask myself the question, 
Well, you know, there is one thing that you know for a fact. Ukraine, that is not a member of NATO and not a member of the European Union, has been invaded. That's a fact. What I don't know is whether the alternative would, all, would have led to an invasion or not. Had Ukraine been a member of NATO, had Ukraine been a member of the European Union, would Russia have invaded it? And the very fact that we don't have an answer by definition to that question tells me that maybe, maybe I was wrong. Uh, and I think that the fact that, that including countries that would have never dreamt about Ukraine's, and not just Ukraine, because, you know, it's Ukraine now, but it could be another country in future. I mean, this is why we're talking about enlargement once again, whether it's Ukraine, Moldova, uh, Georgia, whether it's not that we're making massive steps forward, but at least recognizing that we can't leave the Western Balkans to rot, basically, as we uh, have done in, in recent years. I don't know whether, again, it's like the point about solidarity. I don't know whether this is going to actually lead us uh, uh, to sort of, you know, concretely get to, to a result, but I think the, the terms of the debate have, uh, have changed. Third point um, that I think is extremely relevant is uh, everything that falls into the energy and the climate box. Uh, again, what is interesting here is that we have forgotten about energy security. Energy security was a thing of the past. Interesting, the energy security was very prominent in the debate, um, beginning in the late 1990s, but especially in the first decade of the 2000s. Very interestingly, actually precisely because both in 2006 and in 2009, there were the first two gas crises precisely between uh, Russia and Ukraine. And therefore, those were the years in which, largely pushed by the US, um, you know, there was talk about a southern gas corridor and, uh, and, and energy security was very prominent in, in, in the debate. It then started fading away. You know, once you get to the second decade of the 2000s, we forget about energy security. Now, interestingly, again, you know, I find it fascinating how these dates always coincide. Interestingly, in 2014, we stopped talking about uh, energy security. Should have been precisely because of the annexation of Crimea war in Eastern Ukraine, precisely the time in which we should have remembered about energy security. But no, 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 no one talked about it. And of course, no one talked about it because in 2014, energy prices dropped. When energy prices drop in a relationship like the Europe-Russia relationship, which is at the end of the day, a relationship of interdependence, when prices are high, power, is on the seller side. When prices are low, power is on the buyer side. So from 2014 up until the autumn of last year, energy security was a thing of the past. In fact, we would have magically achieved energy security through the energy transition. And this was the narrative that we were in. Then of course, and it's not a coincidence that Russia decided to wage the war uh, when it did, because of course, beginning in September, prices start rising. Now, initially, my personal reading of this is that initially this was not manipulated. At the very beginning, September, beginning of October, this was demand and supply. I mean, demand shot up after COVID, supply did not because there had been no investments and there had been no investments because prices were low. And you can't, you know, the minute in which you don't have that supply that is readily available, of course, prices start rising. But as prices start rising, Putin understands that his leverage starts increasing. And then you start seeing the manipulation of prices, particularly through the reduction of storage uh, levels, beginning, I would say, around about the second half uh, of October. Of course, the war had been, you know, the idea of the war was there, you know, had been there for a long time. You know, probably he first thought about it back in retrospect back in March, April. Then he got his summit with Biden. Um, you know, he got something. Huh? Uh, then, of course, there's Afghanistan. Then there's the AUKUS deal. Then the prices start rising. And then he says, this is the moment to, to do it. Anyway, energy security starts coming back uh, on the debate. And this kind of leaves us with a bit of a conundrum. Uh, because, of course, conceptually, we still say, we will achieve the energy security through the energy transition. 
But of course, what we need to do immediately today is very little related, you know, not, not related to the transition very much because we need to go and get those fossil fuels elsewhere. And so I think the challenge that we have as Europeans really is not so much in the rhetoric, but actually in the practice, how to reconcile these two things. My personal answer to this is that the decoupling, the energy decoupling from Russia, the die is cast, there is no turning back. But what we really need to make sure is as we diversify our relationships, and they are, let's be frank, they are fossil relationships, I think we gradually need to be built into those fossil relationships, a greening element to it, to be very concrete. If we sign a contract with, I mean, Qatar doesn't need our help yet, but if we sign a contract with Algeria, make sure that it's not just a gas contract that you sign, you know, make sure that you include in it also a renewable component that can, given that these are long-term contracts, can progressively be uh, increased uh, over, over time. So on energy and the transition, I guess I'm slightly more uh, optimistic uh, in the sense that I, I see the direction of travel in a sense more, more clearly. Very final point, and I've Richard spoken too long as always, um, very final point is, um, is everything that falls into the security and defense box. And I really should have said this first because this is not an optimistic point <laughs> to, to end on. Um, I think on security and defense, that is the area where I see um, greatest trouble. Uh, if there is one organization that is not brain dead, uh, that's NATO. And it's very clear that the organization that will be responsible for the defense of Europe is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. That's crystal clear. It does leave the question of if NATO does the defense of Europe, what does European defense do? And, you know, you could say, well, no, I mean, don't be totally pessimistic because some things indeed are being done. And it's true. And I think, you know, it has to be recognized that it's a Copernican revolution to imagine and to see that the commission that looked at defense as, you know, this is a dirty word, the D word is a dirty word, and now it's providing, um, you know, uh, now what, close to two billion uh, of military assistance to a third state in war. So this is, this is important. It's important and it really is a step change. But Frankly speaking, it's not what is making and will make the real difference in terms of, of European defense. So funding, some things will be done. Industry, in terms of greater defense integration, some things will be done there. But operationally, NATO is basically what will be primarily, in fact, I would say, entirely responsible in terms of the defense of Europe. Now, this does not, this is, this is the last, 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 last thing that I'm going to say. This does not mean that there are not things that European defense uh, could and should be doing, things for which we have the capability uh, to do, and that would be extremely useful, both for Europeans and for the world. Uh, I was, you know, discussing this uh, before, um, before I started this talk, but I think something that um, we really should be doing uh, is uh, a humanitarian operation to get the grain out of Ukraine. I mean, to imagine that we're going to achieve this by negotiating with Russia is ridiculous. Of course, we're not going to find an agreement uh, with Russia because Russia will be doing exactly what it's doing, saying, yes, I'm on for it. Can you please lift sanctions? To which we're going to say no, and there's going to be no agreement. And so here we have 20 million tons rotting uh, in the port of Odessa. Problem, obviously, for this year, Another an extra 15 million people risk dying of hunger and the problem for next year, because if those silos are not emptied, where are you going to put the new grain coming in? Huh? So what, what I think we should be doing, and as I said, we have the capability to, to do this, is a humanitarian operation to break the blockade. Basically, what you need to do is literally create a corridor. I mean, it would probably only require about from what I understand, I'm not a military expert, but from seven to eight military ships to create literally a corridor for the civilian cargo ships to, to go in. 
it, it would require certain things. It would require a Ukrainian invitation to, to come in. Obviously, this is these are Ukrainian territorial waters. It would require the consent of Turkey, uh, because Turkey, uh, as in a sense, uh, you know, playing a main role in the Treaty of Montreux, um, at the moment is rightly stopping military ships from passing through the strait. So it would have to, in a sense, um, create an exemption uh, for, for that, because the purpose of those military ships would be to secure a humanitarian corridor, which would probably also mean that Turkey itself would need to play a role in it. So this is a, an operation which I don't see as being an, a European only uh, operation, uh, but a European also, maybe even a European main uh, uh, operation. Um, so it would require a number of things, but as I said, we do have the capability to do this. What we don't have is what we always lack. Uh, which is the willingness to take risk. And that's always the problem. Uh, in, in every action that we don't pursue, it's always because we are not risk takers. And we're not risk takers because we ultimately look at actions as being the risk of an action rather than also considering the risk of inaction. And that is just not the way in which whether it's policy, official debates, but often also academic debates. As, as Europeans, we really struggle to frame things in, in, in this way. And of course, we struggle to frame them in this way because up until now, we have the incredible luxury of not paying high prices for inaction. Or at the very least, those prices, even when we have paid them, have been kind of bumped forward into the long term. So it's normally not the current government <laughs> that will be paying them, but the future ones. Now what we're seeing is that these time frames shortening, shortening, shortening. The cost of that inaction is not something that will come along in a year's time. It's in a few weeks' time, in a few months' time. And yet the terms of our debate still haven't uh, changed. So I'll just leave you with that final thought and hopefully this will spark also lots of uh, interesting questions and discussion. Thank you.